practitioners who will talk about Dutch taboo language and how to model it in a database. Okay, thank you. So yes, in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to present a project that I've just started working on uh, with Gerhard van Huisteen from South Africa. Gerhard is the primary author of this work and he's also the expert on taboo language. Uh, unfortunately, he's not here in Brno, so, um, but he has joined us in cyberspace and if there are any questions, I'm sure he can answer them in cyberspace. So as the title suggests, um, we're going to talk about taboo language. Um, so the presentation does contain language that may offend some people. So if you do not feel comfortable with that, you are still welcome to leave the room. The outline of the talk is as follows. First, um, we'll start by describing what we mean by a lexical database of taboo language and what are possible applications for such a database, why it's necessary. Then we turn to uh, Dutch resources that exist. Um, and then we come to the main part of the presentation, how we want to model taboo language in our lexical database. And we conclude with a brief outlook at yeah, the current status of the project. So first, um, just a quick definition so that we're all on the same page. Yeah, you see it's not completely aligned. I was already worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's full of this interactive uh, animations, but yeah. So for us, taboo language, we use a very simple definition. It's basically linguistics constructions that are potentially offensive to some users in some context. And we'll come back to this uh, a little bit later when we talk about the data model. Okay, yes. So yeah, why? Do, well, we want to create a lexical database for taboo language. What is that for us? For us, that's a digital collection of linguistic constructions. So words, word parts, multi-word expressions that have been annotated and enriched in some way. So this is very similar to what you see, um, or this is related to the lookup list that you often see in natural language applications. Um, and there they're also known as gray list, swear words, stop list, profanity filters, and such lists have their, um, they're useful in their own right. Uh, but we think that having a more detailed description of taboo language will benefit uh, various applications as we feel that there's no one size fits all solution. And the description that we foresee is a very detailed. Just uh, before we get there, uh, different applications. Why do we want to have such a database? Why do we need such a detailed description? Uh, here are some uh, applications that you can think of. Uh, the first one is obvious, I think. Uh, having a database of taboo language will be very useful in the context of offensive language identification for cyberbullying, uh, uh, verbal abuse detection, but also in the context of sentiment analysis um, yeah, where the um, uh, speech acts and the language that are associated um, with taboo language in sentiment ana analysis can often be more subtle and indirect. Obviously, it will also be useful in the context of large language models and AI, because while we do not want these models to uh, spit out toxic language or to start threatening their users, I mean, uh, there are several incidents of this, so that's generally unpleasant behavior of these AI chatbots, and we do not want this, and having a database uh, on taboo language can help there. Third, uh, text filtering is another useful application, and here you should think of predictive text filtering, suggestion filtering. Uh, one example that Gerhard um, say, uh, gave me is that the Apple predictive text filtering would not allow you to, at least in the past, to um, have F and then ending in ing word, but would always replace that by ducking or something like that. Mm -hmm. And similar, if you are creating a dictionary for children, then you do not want it to uh, replace potential typos by swear words. That's, yeah, so. Uh, another useful application is censoring. Um, here you should think about redacting, modifying, replacing, or removing words that are in the database um, by something more neutral. And this is often used in parental control software, 
Uh, think, for instance, of the bleep out in films as well, if there is a swear word appear. And then lastly, uh, I want to mention content filtering. This is important on social media platforms. Often uh, platforms yeah, like Twitter, um, Instagram, they do not allow posts containing um, offensive words, or at least not too many of them. Uh, and they will simply be blocked. We also use content filtering in e-lexicography when we use something, for instance, like the GoodX functionality that's available in Sketch Engine to filter out example sentences that contain uh, certain words. And uh, finally, uh, in the, content, the context of uh, computer-assisted learning applications that ap automatically select suitable text for learners. And in that context, I want to refer to another project that I'm involved in, the crowdsourcing for language learning. So I hope all of you have checked out the demo at lunchtime. If not, please do come and find us, and we're happy to tell you more about that as well. So, and then, yeah, so we do not start from scratch, of course. There's various other, um, there's a lot of ongoing research. There's uh, different lexicons that are being created. For instance, herd lex, starting from Italian and linked to multilingual WordNet, taboo WordNet, starting from offensive and potentially um, inappropriate words for Japanese, also linked to open link, uh, multilingual WordNet, and then the work by Lewandowska, Tomaszczyk, and her colleagues, um, co-authors, on defining an ontology basis uh, for offensive language identification in the context of linked open data. So all that has, of course, inspired us, and we will build on that. Okay, so um, yes, let's now move to the Dutch resources. Okay, where is that? Ah, yeah. Dutch actually has got uh, quite a long tradition in taboo language research, going back to at least 1834, with this article entitled uh, On Some Old Dutch Curses, Oaths, and Exclamations, or in Dutch, over enige oude Nederlandse vloeken, eden en uitroepingen. So that's in 1834. If we go to the more recent future, over the past 45 years, more than 20 uh, printed dictionaries on taboo language have appeared, so on swear words, on erotic words, etc. Always very nice covers. <laughs> but these are all examples of what we call visible lexicography. So they were all, yes, yeah, <laughs> quick, 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 <laughs> published with a certain aim and a certain audience in mind. And then, yeah, they disappear now. Of these, <laughs> only two are available in digital format uh, so that we can use for our project. And that's the dictionary by Piet van Sterkenburg. So is it still? Oh, you don't see it. Well, the one on the, that's for you, on your right-hand side, yes, um, from 2001. And then the other dictionary from Mark de Costa, the um, big swearing uh, dictionary from 2007. Um, so these are available in digital form. Apart from that, yeah, there are still, yeah, numerous other lists available on the internet. And obviously, we will look into these, and we will, and some are better than others. But um, we do list some of these problems with these internet lists in the paper. So look at the paper for yeah why you would not want to use it just as is. Uh, but um, more importantly, these lists are still rather small in terms of size and coverage. The first. Um, version of our database is already si six times bigger than, for instance, the Groninger, that's a particular region in <laughs> the Netherlands, uh, offensive lexicon. So let's now move to the main part of the presentation. So how do we want to model taboo language? As I said, okay, yeah, here it goes wrong. That's a shame. Um, so we have six features in the database. Uh, that we are going to use to describe taboo language. And uh, I was go I'm going to run over each of these features in more detail and show some, ex show some examples and values on the screen that will speak for themselves. And the examples are not in Dutch for those who came to learn <laughs> taboo words in Dutch, but we have used English for 
uh, presentation purposes, but you can find the Dutch examples or some Dutch examples in the paper. So first, the morphosyntactic type. Um, we're not only interested in words, but also in subwords. So for instance, this uh, subword tart has given rise to many taboo words. So we you look at those and we include them as well. We're also interested in the reduction of the forms, the reduced forms, such as the acronyms and the initialisms. And uh, we're very much interested in including multi-word expressions. So, uh, yeah, taboo language constructions, and uh, in particular, the productive constructions, such as the one listed on this slide. Then the next feature that we're interested in is the uh, semantic domain of a taboo construction, such as religion, scatology, animals, disease, etc. And for this, we use an element called denotatum. Um, which is part of sense, and we use it to indicate whether the taboo word relates to an event, a relation, a state, an entity, a locale, or a process. And yeah, the ontology is um, available for those who are interested. Uh, simply need to send an email to Gerhard van Huysteen, and then he will give you access to the ontology that we use. The next uh, up is the taboo type. Here we distinguish between five values, the autophemisms, the euphemisms, dysphemisms, witticisms, and root imperatives. The first three are probably known, and you may wonder why do you include autophemisms in a database of taboo language? Well, even some neutral scientific terms, such as the example listed here, can in some context be considered um, taboo. For instance, in front of your friend mother, you may not use this word, but rather some uh, euphemistic term, for instance, or in a class with fifth graders, similar-ish. Uh, uh, interesting are the witticisms. They come from the literature, um, and these are terms that are created to, yeah, basically, and used to be humorous. Um, and it is, um, so they're not autophemisms, euphemisms, or dysphemisms. They are supposed to be funny, but it is possible that something that starts out as a witticism will eventually become a euphemism or a dysphemism. And finally, the root imperatives that speaks for themselves that are the imperative constructions. The next up is the tabooness value. And uh, why do we include this? Well, we include this to rate words in terms of their observed tabooness in and or for certain groups. And it's important to um, realize as well that this tabooness rating can change over time and that therefore it's very important that it gets regularly checked. I mean, like um, televisions, they yeah, have certain offices that deal with these kind of things and evaluate which words can be used at which time on television and which not, cannot be used. So that's the tabooness value. And then finally, the, to um, deal with the context dependence of taboo words, because we already said in our definition, uh, taboo words are highly, highly context dependent. And we want to capture that uh, by a specific feature, which we call taboo prototypicality. And it expresses the prominence of the taboo word in um, different sources. So something that is in all, sources, taboo will be always taboo, and something that is only sometimes, yeah, can in one particular context maybe is rarely taboo. And then finally, yeah, this is the most <laughs> challenging part. Um, we also want to look at the pragmatic side of a taboo language. So we want to um, capture this by um, indicating the speech act, uh, but also the elocutionary um, intent, so what did the speaker have in mind, and the perlocutionary effects. And the values um, that we have identified, that Gerard has primarily identified, are all values that are cited somewhere in the literature and we've grouped together. But we will keep these, uh, in the first instance at least, as optional for annotation, for editing, because we feel these are the most difficult to annotate objectively. So, so far for taboo language, yes. And then uh, briefly, the current status. 
So, well, yeah, as I already said, we have um, created an ontology which is available for comments and critique. Oh, yeah, I've got plenty of time. So, yeah. <laughs> and then, hold on. Did I go back? Oh, yeah, so this one. So, and uh, we have all, uh, defined an XML structure for our database. Um, and for this, we are, we are experimenting with DMLEX. Uh, you can learn more. It was already mentioned during an earlier presentation in this session. The presentation on DMLEX is tomorrow, the last one of the day, more or less. Um, so, and you can look at the paper. We have completed uh, an initial phase of data extraction. So we use the two dictionaries that I mentioned earlier uh, to establish our candidate lemma list, um, because these are authoritative or considered authoritative dictionaries on the topics. We consider them as a solid base to start from. We also looked at two lists from Wikipedia and Wiktionary, uh, and that results then in just over 5,200 unique uh, lemmas. But we do note that between the different resources that are the input for the candidate uh, list, there's very little overlap. And yeah, that can sometimes have to deal with the different um, focus of the uh, print dictionaries. But uh, yeah, it's also a matter of some words. Uh, yeah, some include everything, even words which are most of the time uh, not taboo and some do include only a limited amount. But and yes, there's just a great variety. So what are we going to do about this? Well, we want to um, check whether what we have got so far is actually valid by checking it against corpus data. But that was already mentioned in the keynote yesterday that <laughs> these occurrence, uh, yeah, these words do not generally occur frequently in the corpora that we have access to. So. Um, not, yeah, the fact that it's not uh, found in a corpus or does not occur in a corpus does not necessarily mean that it does not exist and should not be included. And on the other hand, the fact that it's found in a corpus does not automatically mean that it's actually used in a taboo uh, way. So there will be quite a lot of manual validation still necessary. And uh, we are going to check other existing resources that we have primarily at the Dutch Language Institute, general language dictionaries, but which includes like some kind of label in the definition or have a usage label that suggests that they may be, um, that we may need to include them as well. And then finally, yeah, in the near future, we'll, we'll start with the lexicographic editing of the project. So that's all from us. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm welcome. To, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions now, and if um, you want to do, yeah, get in touch with Gerhard, you can also uh, reach to out to him by email. So thank you. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for the first question. Thank you very much. This sounds fascinating. I haven't seen the ontology yet, so that, that might, this might be a stupid question. Uh, you've addressed the issue a little bit. Uh, have you considered, have you given any thought to typology of uh, maledicta, so to say? I'm sure Gerard has, mm -hmm. but I, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the famous examples, like, uh, for example, there's uh, this uh, Heine line that divides Europe, where there, you have excrement-based maledicta, and then you have sexual-based maledicta. But there's also like specific cases, as in Dutch, for example, or Polish, right around the corner, where uh, sicknesses are use, uh, used as maledicta, you know, kreeg de poke or something like that. So have you given any thought to that, like, like uh, maybe build up a uh, multilingual database? Um, I think that's ultimately what Gerard does have in mind. He's done a lot of work on Afrikaans already. Mm -hmm. And so now we have just started with, yeah, a project for Dutch. But then, yeah, it would be nice to extend it to other languages as well. And yeah, actually before the presentation, I was already talking to our chair of this session. <laughs> that <laughs> it would, yeah, it's, I think the starting to find a small community you are interested in a, a de more detailed description of a taboo language and that we can definitely learn from each other on this oh, as well. So, Thank you yeah. so much. Start from the back. Ah, you were first. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. It's a really uh, in interesting presentation, and it's great that you're considering the pragmatic aspects, which are really important. My question is, could you talk a little bit more about how you're dealing with the diachronic aspect? So um, taboo language is something that changes over time. Have, how are you going to deal with that? Because terms that were taboo maybe 30 years ago are no longer taboo today. Yeah, exactly. I think we will find that first with our candidate list because, well, one of the dictionaries is from 2000 and the right. other one is from 2000, well, 2001 and the other was from 2007. So there's already, like up to now, that's mm -hmm. already a, a big gap, of course. But we are going to check, yeah, against corpus data, whether the words that are in these dictionaries actually still occur or whether we, yeah, and whether we still consider that we should include them. Or yes whether or they no. still occur as taboo language. Yeah, as taboo language. And and to um, to deal with the the change in the rating, we have this uh, tabooness value that's, yeah, supposed to rate, like, is it always taboo, not taboo? And then that can change okay. over time. But to, yeah, how we are going to deal with um, re-evaluating this and reassigning that value every maybe five years. I don't know yet. Machine okay. learning. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I have a question. I'm probably way too picky now. So oh, yeah, uh, that's fine. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> I have a question with your definition of taboo and the designation taboo language. And in, in from the point of view of cultural anthropology, at least, taboo is a concept that regulates society, how society works. It has to do with sacred and profane taboo of people or actions for certain people and, and, and things like that. But isn't it what you do more like uh, obscene, offensive, uh, discriminating curse words rather than taboo language? But maybe that's too picky. Um, no, it's not too picky. It's uh, the definition that I showed was very general, but it's it actually we want to cover all these uh, phenomena that you dis yeah just described or mentioned. So we're not really excluding anything at the moment. So it's the broad picture, but I think at some point we will have to refine maybe. <laughs> More questions. Um, there is a whole lot of variability in what is to do to whom. So there is a yeah. very strong sociolinguistic aspect to it and also regional variation. Certainly in the, you Dutch people uh, swear with diseases. We in the South in Belgium, we don't do that. So yeah. <laughs> will you take into account that variation within the, in the language community? Uh, that's the intention, definitely. So but I didn't see no, that. No, 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 you didn't see that. See but that yeah, that is the intention. So, but yeah. So there will be separate uh, elements in your XML, is that the idea, or in your data model? That will, indicate. yeah. Okay. Good. Anyone else with an interest? <laughs> hey, uh, thank you for this talk. This is really a, a beautiful work. Um, I was wondering about the, uh, you were showing that you're also trying to um, maybe categorize this vocabulary according to the intensity. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering how you did that. I, did you uh, consider looking at the, the, the reception site as well? Because in corpora, we always just find like, you know, the uh, sentences as they're written. But maybe sometimes talking to the communities that are on the side of you know, the recept receptors of this language could also help with the uh, defining the intensity or how do you do it? Yeah, well, these were the values where I said we, yeah, these are difficult to assign by the lexicographer. But um, yeah, we've also realized that having just corpora of written material is not going to be enough for us. But um, luckily at the University of Leiden, they're very much interested in um, dialogue corpora and also from service desks, etc. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so if we can get our, yeah, t um, our hands on that type kind of data and corpus data, then possibly that can help us more also with filling in the values and understanding better the full pragmatics of it. So, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, was it never problematic to publish books with all these words? Because <laughs> we also <laughs> thought about publishing the words we collected, but then people could say, oh, th that word is not on your list, so that I, that one I can use. It's like a, uh, how do you say, a list of words which <laughs> are bad and then the others are not. So. Yeah, I don't... Because it's a tradition that I don't think we have in Denmark to publish uh, dictionaries on on taboo words like that. Yes, well, we have got quite a few in yeah, the Netherlands, so, that so makes it's it it's easy. it's <laughs> interesting. So that <laughs> means that you would have no problem publishing online a list of all these words. I'm not, not saying that we will not have a problem publishing mm -hmm. anything online because I think the times have changed yeah, that's quite that's, that's a lot recently. We get a lot and of reactions on our words in the dictionary, yes. and if we haven't written exactly that this is. Uh, a bad word, then people are very upset. Then, yes, it was even it went all, all the way to the minister once about a word. Yes, that we published. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm very aware of this, and uh, okay. it is uh, one of my main worries in the okay. whole project. Okay. I must say so, but uh, yeah. We're creating a lexical database. Yeah, because so it's normally not people say you shouldn't <laughs> put the words in the dictionary. That's really yes. a general attitude towards but such words. No, it's an important mm. question. And yeah, it's like, what does, yes, is the dictionary going to prescribe here or mm. not? I mean, it has, has already been mentioned various uh, yeah, times. That this, but it's yeah. a nice tradition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, you have got a question or an answer from? Uh, from Gerard, good. Uh, so Gerard says, Jesper van Sterkenburg has set out numerous questionnaires over a period of more than 20 years to ask mm -hmm. users about their reception of swear words. Yeah, so that refers to the perception of swear words. Yes, and, and these papers are actually referred to in the paper, the, the ones from the, what van Sterkenburg did. So yeah, uh, there's still one question at the back then. Thank you. This is great. Um, so I'm wondering if there's an equivalent to Urban Dictionary, um, like a large crowdsourced uh, dictionary online by that that individual users add stuff to. But for Dutch, does that exist? No, that does not exist. Actually, we don't. I don't think we have got a big crowdsourcing project like Open Dictionary projects for Dutch, as far as I am aware. So no. Um. More questions? If not, I, I wanted to say, because I was a, a part of this uh, Lewandowska group who did annotations and offensive language within the Nexus uh, cost action. Um, when we were thinking about doing a similar lexicon for the creation language, then a colleague of mine, who's a well-known computational linguist, said, no, 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 we don't do that anymore. You, you know, we don't need the, the lexicons, lists, and dictionaries in the NLP community. But eventually, I think it's very useful, maybe not for machine learning uh, tasks, but you know, within the lexicographic community, it's very valuable. And it would have been helpful you know, to distinguish what is a taboo, what is obscene, profane, all the differences when you have to annotate then. And it's very context dependent, very. So in a certain context, it's a joke, it's a compliment. So you need to have sentences. And there are a lot of uh, data sets available, corpora annotated for offensive language. And uh, well, if there are no, <laughs> no more um, uh, questions or comments, I uh, just wanted to say, you know who's a very um, prolific community? When we annotated uh, this uh, data set, then Wikipedia editors were um, a group of people who, who showed extremely creative, implicit, offensive language. That was beautiful, you know, to, to read and <laughs> annotate. So there, there are data sets. Uh, it just takes a lot of time to, to do that. So yeah, thank you. I think this is great work. Yeah, but thank you for that too. <laughs> well, with this, we can finish and have coffee break and continue discussions on, on how rude Dutch people are. So. <laughs>